Good morning, and welcome to worship here at First Congregational Church in Melrose, United Church of Christ. Please join me in our call to worship. Though we are separated, we are one body in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God resides in each of us and all of us together. Today is a gift from God, filled with possibility and purpose. In worship, we center ourselves in God so that we live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ. During this time, God heals and strengthens us to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. Through the companionship of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we are never alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. I gracious power so wonderfully sheltered and confidently waiting on what Please join me in prayer. Draw near to us during this time of worship, O God, for we stand in need of your restoration and peace in our hearts. The events of the world today can leave us depleted and adrift, and yet we know that in you there is wholeness for our spirits and purpose for our living. Be with us and guide us, O God, as we share together the prayer that our Savior taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, I invite you to join me in our Ascension Day Affirmation of Faith. We believe that Jesus was resurrected from death on Easter morning and, for a season, appeared to his disciples and others to proclaim new life. We believe that Jesus continues to appear to us in the world and in our own lives today 
when we live out his love in our lives. We believe that after a time of appearing in body, Jesus ascended to God and is now available to us all. We believe that Jesus does not leave us orphaned, but sends the Holy Spirit of God to instruct and inspire us. We believe that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit guide the church today to bring about peace, justice, compassion, and love in the world. We believe that our acts of discipleship allow the powerful love of God to become tangible, especially in times of hardship and challenge. Because of Easter, we cannot be separated from the presence of God. Because of Easter, we are called to build the realm of God in the here and now. Amen. Listen for the word of God found in the book of Acts. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over the course of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. May we take this message into our hearts and bring it forth in our lives.
Well, good morning to the children out there. It's good to be spending some time with you this morning. And you know, this morning I wanted to tell you that when I was a kid, there was a TV show on that I watched when I was really little called Romper Room. And uh, some of the grown-ups may remember that show too. It was this really kind of fun show on TV. It was sort of like, um, like a, a daycare or, or preschool or even kindergarten on TV. So the kids would have a lot of fun. They'd play some games and they'd learn some things. And there was a there was a, a host or a teacher on the show. And when the show would end, uh, the teacher, the host, would have this mirror. And she'd look into this magic mirror and she would like be able to see everybody out there in TV land. And she'd say, I see, and she'd name people like, I see Billy, I see Mary, I see uh, Joey. And so she'd name kids names. And I never heard my name because my name's kind of unusual, right? Dominic's sort of an unusual name. So I was always disappointed that I never heard my name. Well, my parents decided to write into the show they wrote in to the host and asked her to say my name. I didn't know they did that. So I'm watching one day, and the show ends, and they got the mirror. She's got the mirror, and she's saying, I see uh, Billy, I see Mary, I see Dominic. I couldn't believe it. She said my name. She said my name on TV. It was a great day uh, on Romper Room. It was probably the greatest episode I ever saw of Romper Room. Names are important. Names are important. Your name is important. And in the Bible, there's a whole lot of names. There's a whole lot of names. And in, the, in the, the second part of the Bible, the New Testament, the part about Jesus, there's a bunch of names there too. Four of them are really important, though, that you should know. And those would be Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the four uh, people who wrote the Gospels that are in the Bible. The Gospels are the stories of Jesus, what Jesus did, what he said, what he taught, where he went. All of that, those stories are in those four Gospels written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And each of those four Gospels, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, end with the story of Easter. And if you want to know what happened after Easter, what happened to Jesus, what happened to the church, uh, the followers of Jesus, there's another book that follows those called the Book of Acts or Acts of the Apostles. Now, the Book of Acts tells all about what happened after Jesus went back to live with God in heaven. And it was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts are written by the same person. Mm -hmm. So follow along here, because and when you, if you look at the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, they start with Luke uh, talking to or writing to a person named Theophilus, which is another great name, Theophilus. Um, he says, dear Theophilus, like, almost like it's a letter he's writing to this person. Now, we don't know who Theophilus was. He could have been a friend of Luke. He could have been um, somebody who was trying to figure out what this new religion called Christianity was. Who was Jesus? What happened? And Luke's telling him what happened. Uh, and so it could, have been, it could have been somebody like that. But we don't know. What we do know is that the whole New Testament, the whole part of the Bible written about Jesus, was written in the language Greek. Now, it probably doesn't come as a surprise to you that I don't speak Greek. But I like to look stuff up about uh, things in the Bible and Greek words in the Bible. And Theophilus, the name Theophilus, is a Greek name. It's a Greek word. And it means friend of God. Theophilus means friend of God. Do you know any friends of God? Aha, that's you. You're a friend of God. I'm a friend of God. We're all friends of God. So Theophilus, I like to think, is you, is all of us. So Luke is writing his gospel and writing the book of Acts to us. We're Theophilus. We're friends of God. Because God's a friend of us and we're a friend of God. So I hope you remember that, not just about the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, but the whole thing, the whole Bible, is written to friends of God. And that means 
you, Theophilus, and me, Theophilus. We're all friends of God. So this is your book. This is your book. So I hope you will find um, a version that you like and dig in and read it because there's some great stories in here uh, and inside those stories are great lessons. That's, that's the part that I like. Um, but it's your book. So you, Theophilus, friend of God, should get into this and read some stories um, about Jesus and what happened before Jesus, what happened after Jesus. Wonderful lessons about God to draw you closer to your friend, God, because we're all friends of God. We're all Theophilus. So something to think about this week, and uh, I look forward to catching up with you next week. Well, it's good to have you with us uh, again here at First Congregational Church in Melrose, United Church of Christ, for worship. Whether you're watching on Sunday morning or at some other time, it's great to have you uh, with us. And you may be asking, why are we still doing it this way? Why are we still having virtual worship when Governor Baker gave the green light for uh, churches and houses of worship to uh, return to in-person uh, worship in a modified way? Why are we still doing it this way? Well, that's because we don't think it's a good idea just yet just yet to come back in that way. We've decided uh, some time ago to use the Melrose Public Schools as our barometer for when to return in uh, to in-person worship. And because uh, they decided to, can uh, to cancel um, the academic, uh, the remainder of the academic year for in-class time, we decided to do likewise uh, with regard to in-person worship. Uh, so right now, we will continue our uh, virtual worship uh, through the end of this program year. So uh, our last virtual worship service will be on June 21st, and we will then make uh, an evaluation at the end of summer uh, about how we will return to worship, uh, whether virtually or in person, uh, in September. Our Southern New England Conference of the United Church of Christ uh, has recommended the same thing. Uh, because the bottom line is that in the context of what are essential things uh, uh, during this reopening time, uh, we view the health and well-being of our parishioners and the wider community to be the most essential thing. And we don't want to jeopardize the hard-won gains that we have made uh, against this virus by coming back too soon uh, into this sanctuary. So. I will continue to wor welcome you here uh, to worship uh, for the time being. Uh, and with that, I want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, one is that next Sunday will be Graduation Sunday. We have a, a tradition in our church of uh, uh, congratulating and, and recognizing uh, the youth in our church who are graduating from high school. And even though we can't come together uh, yet for in-person worship, we're still going to do that uh, anyway. So I hope you'll join in next week for that. Uh, and the week after that, June 7th, uh, will be our uh, Communion Sunday uh, for the month of June. And uh, it will also be uh, our uh, Spring Congregational Meeting uh, Sunday. So for the members of our church, uh, look for word on how that's going to work. We're still working that piece out uh, because we'll need to, uh, in some form at least, um, ga gather together to, uh, to approve a slate of officers and to uh, review the annual reports. We're also experimenting with Zoom for Bible study and uh, for a coffee hour, uh, so look for further word on that. Right now, though, I'd like to invite your offering uh, this morning. So please take a moment to go to our website and make a contribution there to support the ministries uh, of First Congregational Church. And in recognition of those offerings, I offer this word of blessing. Oh, holy God, we thank you that in the Bible you do address us as your friends, as Theophilus, for we are your friends and we partner with you in building a world that is an expression of your compassion, justice, and love. Bless these offerings by the power of your Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.
And I invite you to hear these words from the Gospel according to Luke. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and, lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple, blessing God. Here ends our scripture lessons for this morning. May God add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of these holy words. And will you pray with me? Compassionate Creator, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts bring us into deeper relationship with you, you who are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, last Thursday was indeed Ascension Day. And I know you all had that one marked on your calendar, and even though it's the pandemic, I'm sure you had a great day of celebration with food and games and calling extended family and all of that sort of thing. I'm kidding, of course, because Ascension Day is not a well-recognized holiday, even within uh, religious circles. I really doubt that you had it circled on your calendar. Now, that's not to say it hasn't been around for a while. It's been around for a really long time. In fact, Ascension Day is one of the earliest Christian holidays, and it dates back to the fourth century. So it's been around a while. Still, we don't really pay much attention to it, and we prefer to focus on things like Christmas and, and Easter. Uh, even even uh, private employers recognize those. Not so much with Ascension Day, but it's an important day with some important lessons for us, particularly right now. Ascension Day is always 40 days after Easter Sunday, so that means that the season of Easter is now over. We're looking ahead to Pentecost next uh, Sunday. More about that next week. But if we're honest, though, the modern uh, progressive church today really doesn't know what to make of the ascension of Christ because the notion that Jesus rose up, bodily rose up, into the clouds stretches the boundaries of what a lot of people are comfortable with. But, setting aside the truth that being comfortable isn't the goal of faith, that's another sermon, I think we miss uh, some important aspects of what it means to be Christian if we toss this whole story aside. First, in a lot of ways, uh, the story of the Ascension isn't so much about Jesus, it's about the disciples. It's about the disciples. Because remember, these were people who were... They were pretty much emotionally exhausted because they had, they had witnessed the crucifixion of Jesus, which to them meant that his ministry and his message had failed. So they were lost, they were dejected, they were grief-stricken. And then along comes Easter morning, and they're overjoyed. They're overjoyed to find that Jesus is alive again and to discover that, yes, in fact, God does have control of things. And now, Jesus is leaving again. And this again must have been very difficult for them because their lives had been so shaped by his presence. They had moved according to his schedule. Their, their conduct had been defined by his agenda. And now he was gone. They were emotionally exhausted. And you know what? During this pandemic, a lot of us are exhausted too. We run the emotional uh, gamut, this, this roller coaster 
uh, of emotions from fear of this virus to, to uh, indignation about how it's being handled uh, to joy that, uh, around the possibility of things opening up again in terms of activities and employment. Jesus recognizes that. Jesus recognizes this roller coaster of emotions and he gives us the same advice that he gave those first disciples. Take time to get your bearings. He, Jesus told his followers to, to return to Jerusalem when he departed because they needed time. They needed time to adjust to his physical absence. They needed time to adjust to all of the changes that were happening. His follower, the followers of Jesus needed time to adjust and refocus and come together. And you know what? So do we. So do we. With the Easter season now behind us and the prospect of a reopening of our country, like those disciples, you and I need time to heal, to come to grips with new realities, and to refocus. And as we do that, and while we do that, we need to remember something. We need to remember our mission. That's an important ingredient in, in doing this because it avoids our getting stuck. And by that I mean, remember in that, in the, in that first reading, remember those men in white robes in the story. It was they who asked, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? Like the first followers of Jesus, we also can become stuck looking up, waiting for God to come and, and fix everything, or stuck looking back, focused on the past, what things were like before the pandemic. Getting your bearings is one thing, but like the disciples who were admonished by angels about standing around looking up after Jesus ascended, we need to make sure that we aren't caught stargazing or daydreaming or sleepwalking through our discipleship. That's because once we do get our bearings, we have work to do in this new era. Because nobody knows what this new normal is going to look like exactly, and that's a huge opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for the church. It's a huge opportunity for each person of faith to help guide, to help shape what will guide us going forward. Will we return to what the old normal looked like completely? I sure hope not. I sure hope we can evolve into a, into a new level of compassion, a new level of redefinition of power and privilege in this country. We have work to do because the love of God requires justice for all people, requires that not only for those who are powerful enough to get what they need and, and want. The ascension of Jesus ended the chapter of God's work that involved his earthly ministry, but it did not end God's work in this world through us. So we have to resist the temptation to just stand around looking up. Because in the final analysis, like those first disciples, we can either stand around or we can get busy because we have God's work to do. We have justice building to do. We have confessing and forgiving to do. We have healing to do. We have protesting and confronting to do. We have hoping to do. We have falling down and overcoming to do. We have trusting and praying and questioning and believing to do. That's the work we are to be about right now. And those two, let's call them angels in white robes, are there in this story to remind us that God will never forget us. God will never abandon us. God is with us to give us encouragement and prodding and prodding to help us carry on the ministry of Christ in these days. As the new normal begins to take shape, we can't afford to be caught just standing around, lost in self-doubt, lost in self-pity, or even in self-worship. The story of Christ's ascension is a bit overwhelming. I get that. I can only imagine how overwhelming it was for the disciples who were there. 
But we, like them, have each other, and we have divine encouragers around us all the time. The season of Easter is over. God's work calls us. Christ is counting on us. And you can be sure that the Holy Spirit will be there to comfort and guide and equip us in the days ahead. So let's not just stand around looking up. Let's get busy. Amen. And I hope you'll join me now in a spirit of prayer. Oh God, we do indeed need to get our bearings as we move out of the season of Easter and as we move into this new period of opening up during this pandemic. As we navigate these waters, help us to stay centered in our faith in you. Help us to remember who we are and why we are here. For we are your people, and we are here to build your realm in this world. Hear the prayers of our hearts this morning, O God. Give strength and courage to those who are on the front lines. Be with those who are ill and hurting in body, mind, or spirit. Help us to be careful and deliberate in our steps forward in this country and in our world in the coming days, weeks, and months. Bless our church as we continue to reflect your love to all. And as we look ahead to Pentecost, we pray, come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. And now I invite you to go forth in the peace and the love of God. Go forth as Theophilus, as a friend of God. Go forth to get your bearings in this challenging time and to deepen your faith. And then go forth to get busy, to get busy doing the work of God's compassion and justice in this world. Go forth to be the evidence that ours is a loving God. Go forth in confidence. Go forth in the peace of Christ. Amen.